Theodore Rechte was a great American contemporary poet. He put poetry on the map for the Northwest. Yeah, he's internationally renowned. Yes, he won the Pulitzer Prize. I read his poetry in The New Yorker. He wrote about slugs and roots. He liked all living things. He was a great teacher. His students either loved him or feared him. He became a writer of place in the Northwest. The use of language is one of the differences between us and the apes. Poetry is language at its most memorable, at its best. There should be a focus on the minutiae of life, the little things in life. What's greater, pebble or pond? What can be known? The unknown. My true self runs toward a hill, more, oh more visible. Now I adore my life with a bird, the abiding leaf, with a fish, the questing snail, and the eye altering all. And I dance with William Blake for love, for love's sake. And everything comes to one as we dance on, dance on, dance on. He felt such a sense of mission. He felt, I'm sure that great singers feel like this too. They're carrying a voice around that is precious that is vulnerable. He, he was a surprise. He was a tremendous surprise to American poetry. He managed to, to control some savage power in the language that had been neglected. His students infested the whole Northwest with uh, Retkin views of, of poetry. The whiskey on your breath could make a small boy dizzy. But I hung on like death. Such waltzing was not easy. We romped until the pan slid from the kitchen shelf. My mother's countenance could not unfrown itself. The hand that held my wrist was battered on one knuckle. At every step you missed, my right ear scraped a buckle. You beat time on my head with a palm caked hard by dirt then waltz me off to bed, still clinging to your shirt. Of course, I put in a few fibs there. My father's palm never was caked hard by dirt, but he simply loved those roses of his and often watered them far into the night. He'd come in in his rubber boots and cold, take himself a little schluck, and then I'd hook my feet over his rubber boots and we'd start uh, dancing to his whistling. His father, uh, as is well known, because he wrote about him as a greenhouse keeper, apparently a very talented one, very Germanic about it all. He was a hard drinker and a, and a tough man to please, and Ted had a love-hate relationship with him. The greenhouse was his symbol for uh, all of life, uh, the, the place, the creative place where, where things are protected and grow. And uh, some of his most memorable work is about these acts where he, a, a boy, was under benches where roots were hanging obscenely and where r things were going rotten and new life was springing out of rottenness and decay. Nothing would sleep in that cellar, dank as a ditch. Bulbs broke out of boxes, hunting for chinks in the dark. Shoots dangled and drooped, falling obscenely from mildewed crates. Hung down long yellow evil necks like tropical snakes. And what a congress of stinks. Roots ripe as old bait. Pulpy stems rank, silo rich. Leaf mold, manure, lime, piled against slippery planks. Nothing would give up life. Even the dirt kept breathing a small breath. Shortly before he was married, he was fairly sure he was never going to be. 
I don't believe uh, that he thought it was possible for him to take love seriously. And afterward, uh, after marriage, there was a burst of it. And his love poems are, are a large portion of his work thereafter. I was a student of his when I was 17. I went to Bennington rather early and I fell in love with him because he was a marvelous teacher. There were a lot of girls in love with him, I'm afraid. He noticed me because I had an Irish name, O'Connell, and he, he was very, uh, he loved Yeats and Irish writers. And when I was in my third year, and he had left, and I was quite depressed. I wasn't in touch with Ted at all. I, I had a, a modeling job. After I'd done the modeling, I decided to go back to teaching, and I got a job at, in, a, in, in Harlem. There was another teacher, and he said, Theodore Retke is going to give a reading, and I said, oh, look, he was my teacher. <laughs> I was very, very excited, but his attitude was, well, do you think he'll remember you? I went to the reading. As I was crossing the street, there was Ted walking right beside me. So I, I just touched his arm and said, remember me? I think I felt basically that I knew him because I had seen him over a long period, seven years earlier. And when I married him, I was 27, but almost 28. And he was 17 years older. <laughs> Our, our honeymoon took place on Ischia, an island off Na Naples. And this was a gift that Auden gave us, our, our wedding present. He had a house there. So I suppose the first poems you could say were about me were written there. Light listened. Oh, what could be more nice than her ways with a man? She kissed me more than twice once we were left alone. Who'd look when he could feel? She'd more sides than a seal. The close hair faintly stirred, light deepened to a bell, the love beat of a bird. She kept her body still and watched the weather flow. We live by what we do. All's known, all all around, the shape of things to be. A green thing loves the green and loves the living ground. The deep shade gathers night, she changed with changing light. We met to leave again, the time we broke from time. A cold air brought its rain, the singing of a stem. She sang a final song, light listened when she sang. He absorbed an awful lot from the wild, wildness around Seattle, simply by sitting in it or, or walking a short way in it and, and uh, becoming part of it. The waking. I wake to sleep and take my waking slow. I feel my fate in what I cannot fear. I learn by going where I have to go. We think by feeling what is there to know. I hear my being dance from ear to ear. I wake to sleep and take my waking slow. Of those so close beside me, which are you? God bless the ground. I shall walk softly there and learn by going where I have to go. Light takes the tree, but who can tell us how? The lowly worm climbs up a winding stair. I wake to sleep and take my waking slow. Great nature has another thing to do to you and me. So take the lively air and, lovely, learn by going where to go. This shaking keeps me steady. I should know what falls away is always and is near. I wake to sleep and take my waking slow. 
I learn by going where I have to go. I am damned and eternally bored with the people who seem to imply that teaching is some sort of soft way of life. Uh, I feel it, it remains a second order creation as opposed to poetry. Good teaching is damned hard work, and there are a great deal of emotional pressures, and particularly visceral or manic teaching of the sort that I go in for. Since I don't know anything, I have to use makeup for energy, noise, and <laughs> general pandemonium. He knew a great many poems by heart, and he could never bring enough books to class because for, to take care of the references he felt he needed to make. And if you didn't, if you weren't willing to read the bulk of poetry written in English in a hurry, as fast as possible, as soon as possible, then you couldn't expect to be as good as you hoped. He tried not to harm people's feelings uh, too seriously because you have to have a certain amount of ego in order to write anything at all. And he, he knew this and he could be very tender to, to students who were cringing. Ted was bipolar and the whole up and, up and down of it, uh, I remember he said he had a conversation with Robert Lowell on the subject uh, and they agreed that they both went in and out of the madhouse as though it had a revolving door. Uh, Retke was protected in his job by uh, the head of the English department, Robert Heilman. I think his students felt protective of him, too. No one was ever afraid of him. He was only uh, verbally incoherent at times or frightening. There aren't very many electrifying teachers like that, but he, he was one. If you were a real student of creative writing, then Retke was your, was your commander. Um, he affected my teaching and my poetry so much, you know, but I only had him that one term. And this was so instructive to me that a teacher, you could have that teacher for one uh, term, but it was just a quarter, really. It was a very short time, and they would affect you for the rest of your life. He taught that class like it was a music class. Yes. Mm -hmm. always, I never saw him sit down. So he was always walking with the book if he was reading, or, and everything was a musical uh, event, and he was like a conductor. Uh, he, also, he really knew the class was drama, you know, and there was no boring moment in it. And even if he was festering, it, you know, that was drama. Remember how we all stood around the hall downstairs here with our faces to the wall, memorizing? When I started working for him, interestingly enough, I think both Retke and I were quite shy of one another. He didn't really know how to talk to me, which is probably unusual, nor I to him, and it took a little while to break the ice on that. But when I finally became Gloria Dear, I knew I had got to <laughs> It had a children's poem that said, I am a bear, a biddly bear, we biddlies are peculiar bears. And I was so in love with the word biddly that I named my next dog Biddly. And Ted was delighted. You'd, you'd think I'd given him the crown of England. Ted made an impression on you. And the first time I was introduced to him, <clears throat> he shook my hand and then he said, don't let the bastards get you down. <laughs> I'm getting old and I can't teach with this fury forever, and particularly the goddamn writing class. I mean, the, that, that hangs on me and I worry about it. And I still, as long as I've, uh, I mean, I still get streaks where I puke before class and, you know, just, or do I know enough? I hear flowers. A ghost can't whistle. I know, I know. Hello, happy hands. I had a message the morning of our wedding that I would have him in and out of hospital. I think the worst time, of course, was the very first time I didn't know anyone. 
And then this breakdown possibly connected with his, the news that Dylan Thomas had died. As soon as he was in hospital, I thought, oh, well, that'll be all right. He'll be, okay. He'll be looked after there. But then the drugs that they were giving him were dangerous. When I asked the doctor, could he give him more uh, a tranquilizing drug? And he said, I've given him en enough to kill a horse. So I then was worried. What he wrote when he was high, I think, was less good. When he was manic, he wrote very badly. Some of his poems might allude to times when he was ill, such as, in a dark time, the eye begins to see. Well, a poem that was written quite swiftly was that in a dark time. It took me about three days. It was in summer, and I was sitting out there in the grass. And the concentration, well, I'd had some of the lines were in notebooks before. But I finally wrote it, as I say, in about three days, and I had the sense that, that this is one of the great poems of our time. I mean, I just knew it. In a dark time, the eye begins to see. I meet my shadow in the deepening shade. I hear my echo in the echoing wood. Lord of a nature, weeping to a tree. I live between the heron and the wren, beasts of the hill and serpents of the den. What's madness but nobility of soul at odds with circumstance? The day is on fire. I know the purity of pure despair, my shadow pinned against a sweating wall. Dark, dark, my light, and darker my desire. My soul, like some heat-maddened summer fly, keeps buzzing at the sill. Which I is I, a fallen man, I climb out of my fear. The mind enters itself, and God the mind, and one is one, free in the tearing wind. Writing for me is not an easy thing to do. I always am always terrified sort of with a feeling that, well, is this the last time? He always taught, would say, I want to break into a new style. And that was sort of nagging him and pushing him all the time. His way of working was to put together these fragments that he would make notes of. Uh, at odd times on a clipboard or in a spiral notebook at a, almost all occasions of his life. Even at parties, he would often have a, a clipboard. And when, if he happened to come up, have a line that he thought was good, he would try to build on it, I think, or find, find another line somewhere else. Therefore, the house was littered with papers. What he would gather together then in meaningful shapes some often two or three years later. The Happy Three was written when we were renting Morris Graves' house, and it was really a very grand, beautiful house. I went out and bought two geese, and um, we named them after Marianne Moore and Louise Bogan, two poets we liked. Later, Morris Graves gave us a beautiful drawing of two geese like them. The Happy Three. Inside, my darling wife sharpened a butcher knife, sighed out her pure relief that I was gone. When I had tried to clean my papers up between words skirting the obscene, she frowned her frown. Shells have a special use and why muddy shoes in with your underclothes, she asked, woman. So I betook myself with not one tiny laugh to drink some half and half on the back lawn. Who should cut up right then but our goose, Marianne, having escaped her pen, hunting the sun? Name for a poetess whom I love nonetheless, her pure white featheriness she paused to preen. But when she pecked my toe, my banked up vertigo vanished like April snow. All rage was gone. 
Then a close toey a Phoebe not far away sang out audaciously, notes finely drawn. Back to the house we ran, me and dear Marianne. Then we romped out again, out again, out again, three in the sun. His depressions didn't bother me. In fact, one, one day he said, uh, you'll be happy to hear I was mildly depressed today. So, but the manic phases were very upsetting. I did feel in 1960, I, I was feeling it was a bit of a burden being married to Ted. I think I wanted to have a more normal life and, and have children, but I decided I would stick with it if it killed me, really. And I think right towards the end when he was off again, I mean, I felt exhausted. The Rose is one of his very best. In it, the, all the elements that he struggled with in, his, in the latter part of his life gather together and, and grow. A rose on San Juan Island, that was the inspiration for that. Ted loved that area, it's very beautiful. And, I, and of course, he responded to the beauty of the state of Washington, particularly the areas of water. The last big piece I've done was the one this summer, the rose. Oh, Christ, uh, my father was a specialist in roses. And just seeing it, Jesus Christ. I mean, I, I still start want me to do a poem, Weeping. It, it was like something almost that, that uh, was beyond the human. This rose, this rose in the sea wind stays, where the salmon ease their way into the kelp beds, and the sea rearranges itself among the small islands. Near this rose, in this grove of sun-parched, wind-warped madronas, among the half-dead trees, I came upon the true ease of myself. As if another man appeared out of the depths of my being, and I stood outside myself, beyond becoming and perishing, a something wholly other. As if I swayed out on the wildest wave alive, and yet was still. And I rejoiced in being what I was, in the lilac change, the white reptilian calm, in the bird beyond the bough, the single one, with all the air to greet him as he flies, the dolphin rising from the darkening waves. And in this rose, this rose in the sea wind, rooted in stone, keeping the whole of light, gathering to itself sound and silence. Mine and the sea winds. It's my belief that a thing perceived finally, when one looks so long at the object or looked at it out of love or has looked at it habitually until you become the object and it becomes you. I can say this without batting an eye, that I know in the final term something about mystical experience. That is the one time I played the Rambo business of really driving myself and seeing whether you could derange the senses and it can be done. And let me tell you, I did it. That is, you go way beyond yourself and accompanying this, you get the transfer of senses. The strange sort of a, a sense of a, being a part of the whole universe. You feel that you are eternal, that you are immortal. And furthermore, death becomes, as it were, an absurdity. He died of a blood clot going to the brain. Mrs. Lodell 
and her daughter, Lely, invited him to come and swim at their beautiful swimming pool and complex. And when he dove in, this blood clot hit his brain and, and Eulalie tried to give him artificial respiration, but it was too late. There's always something, there's not so much now, but now you see, I don't see well. Uh, I, I lost the sight of one eye, and then I've had uh, glaucoma in the other. So I am registered partially sighted. I'm very lucky in having a, a husband who is a, an excellent editor and a former English teacher. He's glad I've had a life with, with a poet. Naturally, they're not dated, but I kept all of them. I was here, you wasn't. Love, T. <laughs> I remember that one. <laughs> I, I, I have the feeling I've been married to two marvelous English teachers. Quiet with the two policemen, <laughs> and they were very nice. We have a garden, and... Uh, when I walk, walk out in, in the spring, it come, the first line comes to me. When the crocuses poke up their heads in the usual places, and frog scum appears on the pond with the same froth of green, boys moon at girls with last year's fatuous faces. I never am bored, no matter how familiar the scene. Although it's all happened before, I cannot grow bitter. I rejoice in the spring as though no spring ever had been. Many, many have learned from him and all young poets read him and are aware of what he did. And he's in their veins, I think. I remember asking him, did you always want to be a great poet? He said, well, I wanted, to be a, I wanted to be a great something. And then he said, do you think I'm great? Well, I said, yes. And he said, well, you might have said something about it earlier. <laughs> something of that sort was funny.